All right, good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight for Preservation Resource Center online class. We're happy tonight to be spotlighting many of our partners um, and community members with whom we've had the pleasure of working over the last year. My name is Nathan Lott. I'm a researcher and advocate at PRC. And I welcome you tonight. Thank you for giving us a little bit of your time. Hopefully it's gonna be a lot of fun and we'll have time uh, not just for a short presentation from each of our guests, but also for some lively Q&A. So a bit of housekeeping. Uh, those of you that are participants in the webinar are muted, so you can't speak verbally to our presenters, but you can enter your questions in either the chat box or the Q&A box. If you can put them in the Q&A box, that'll be great. We can keep track of those questions and make sure that we get them all answered when we get to the panel stage uh, and the conversation stage uh, in just a few minutes. I want to thank uh, all of our generous donors and sponsors who make these educational initiatives of PRC possible, the Hellas Foundation among them, for supporting arts here in New Orleans. And that's gonna be a great subject of our conversation tonight. Um, the role of arts in place making and as our title reference place keeping, which is a phrase that I borrowed from our first speaker tonight, or you know, greatness borrows, genius steals, stolen outright. But um, anyway, yeah, the, uh, she'll, she'll talk more about that, so I won't steal any more of her thunder. But um, you know, the nexus between arts and preservation is really longstanding, and we know that so well at PRC because 45 years ago, more than 45 years ago, we got our start uh, amongst other things, rescuing Julia Rowe, which is a, a famous set of row houses in New Orleans. And now it's at the epicenter of an arts district in what some of you would know as the warehouse district of New Orleans. There are galleries on the ground floors of many of those buildings. And so the, the marriage between the preservation of historic buildings and the promotion of fine arts and folk art and um, the arts broadly speaking has been longstanding and it's been very fruitful in our city and it will continue to be even through the pandemic. And we'll talk some about how organizations are meeting the challenges presented by the COVID-19 pandemic um, to ensure that artists and artisans still have opportunities in our city and our state. I wanna um, point out to everyone that in addition to this online class, we've got two more slated for December. We're going to have a book talk with Tara Shaw next week and a book talk with Robbie Cangelosi the following week about um, his long, long in the making work on the history and architecture of Carrollton. So if you're a resident of Carrollton or the university area, you will be sure to attend that, I hope. And in the midst of all that, we've got our annual holiday home tour. So this is our magazine, Preservation in Print. This issue features an article by uh, Kelsey McCurry, who's with us tonight. And it also features um, several of the homes that are on our virtual holiday home tour. Obviously we can't do it in person this year. It's gonna be a bit different, but it's still gonna be our biggest fundraiser of the year. So if you haven't already, I hope you will buy tickets for the holiday home tour, December 12th and 13th. And you'll be able to watch videos and tour the houses of Press Kavikoff, Mary Matlin and James Carville, Brian Batt, amongst others. And they've got some great art collections, let me tell you, as well as some impressive houses. So again, I hope that if you haven't already bought your tickets, you will, um, knowing that that's going to support the work that I do and my colleagues do at PRC throughout the year in partnership with the community and in service to the community. So uh, without further ado, let me first introduce Kelsey McCreary, who is with the Division of the Arts in the Lieutenant Governor's Office of Culture, Recreation and Tourism. And she manages the State Cultural District Program. And so she has a really unique perspective on what cultural districts are, what they can be, and the many different ways that they are being used to promote arts, crafts, artisans, and special places, historic places, um, and also create ec economic opportunity for the residents throughout Louisiana. So I know Kelsey's gonna share with us 
some great lessons that we can bring back here to New Orleans. And she's been a great partner to PRC um, as we've worked in Carrollton, Holly Grove, and now Seventh Ward and Turo Bologna to help bring these resources to more of our community. So thank you so much for being here, Kelsey. Thank you, Nathan. That was so sweet. I'm going to go ahead and prepare everybody that's in the Zoom room that my roommate, my 18 pound roommate, his name is Murphy. And if the mailman comes late this evening, you're going to hear from him. So I'm going to go ahead and apologize in advance for that. Um, he's a bit of a camera hog and likes to make his presence known. Um, like Nathan said, I'm the director of civic design and cultural districts for the Division of the Arts. And the reason why they put a creative placekeeping program inside of the Division of the Arts is because that's the right home for it. You know, for a while when the program was first conceived, it was underneath Main Street, it was in historic preservation. And they realized that the arts really overlapped with all of those things and allowed them to come together, um, no matter what that tool may be coming out of the toolbox. If it was historic preservation, if it was economic development, there was always going to be that artistic element to it. And so it was kind of a put your money where your mouth is moment, not that there's money associated with the program, so don't get that twisted, but where they said, okay, if we really think that arts belong at the table of all of these conversations, then we need it to come from the arts. Um, so with that, I'm gonna share my screen and show you guys a couple things today. We're gonna look at the program as a whole, and then we're gonna look at, um, I believe I'm gonna turn it back over uh, to Nathan and the folks at PRC and let them talk about the two new districts that were certified um, in the city this last cycle, so for 2020. Uh, let's see. I think you guys can see. Um, okay, so this is our new little logo that we finally had designed. Uh, the program had been in existence for almost 10 years and didn't have a brand, and that was just horrifying to me. So um, we contracted with a Louisiana designer to be able to, to Pull this together and hopefully give the the program a, a cool brand that would be representative of all the communities um we have 115 districts we have a lot um i know louisiana is is last in a lot of categories but we're first in this one so you guys can start to tout this whenever you talk about our state um, most states do not have uh you know place making place keeping programs um, they concentrate around urban areas they often don't have resources for uh, the rural areas. And so it's pretty cool that our program is open to anyone um, and that any community that has a cultural asset that they want to protect or a community identity that they're trying to resurrect or further, they can apply and become part of the program. So we're in 41 parishes right now. Um, and my goal is to eventually get to 64, but uh, there's only one of me. So split me by 115. Uh, so here's the map. You're going to see these in a little bit more detail later from the individual partners that are gonna talk about their districts. These are the state versions of the maps. Uh, the ones you'll see in a few minutes are much cooler than this, um, but this is your first one, this is AP Turo. And we had um, a socially distanced outdoor meeting with them a couple weeks ago. And it was so awesome because I was able to meet, uh, I believe it was two of AP Turo's descendants. Isn't that right, Pam? I think it was his grandson or his great grandson. So that was a, a really cool moment for us um, to be able to talk to them and hear from them. Right, Pam? Did I say that right? Yes, that, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it was it was a great day. Um, and we were able to meet right there in the park that's dedicated to him and to his memory and his work. Um, and secondly, uh, this is the, the last district that was certified in New Orleans so far. Um, you guys make up a huge lion's share of that 115. And at some point, the entire city is going to be a cultural district. So this is New Orleans at a glance. Um, all of the districts that have been certified so far, uh, most of them came in in the beginning of the program right around 2008. And um, if you're not familiar, the program was a response to Hurricane Katrina, but it was also a statewide cultural economy study. And that's before creative economy, cultural economy, all those weren't buzzwords yet. They just, they were starting to figure out that artists really contributed to the GDP and, and to the economy, go figure. And so a study was actually commissioned back in before and then after Katrina, they revisited it and they really wanted to know where did the artists go? What happened to them? What are they making? And so from that study, some of the recommendations were for the state level agencies to partner with those municipal governments to enable those communities to bounce back. And so there's two incentives associated with the cultural districts program, one of which, of course, most of the people on this call are probably pretty, pretty familiar with its historic tax credits. And the other was a tax exemption on sales of original artwork. And I won't dive too deeply into those because that's, um, it can get complicated. And to, today and tonight, I really want us to focus on some of the other types of projects that can come out of retaining a cultural district certification. 
Um, this is a lot of text. So I'm going to blow through it pretty quickly because I think I have like less than 10 minutes and I can talk really quickly. So y'all have to tell me if I need to slow down. Um, the intention of the program really what it's all about is equipping that community or that, you know, area of the city with the language and with, you know, the resources that it needs to be able to talk about what it's doing. You know, sometimes you'll see an example here in a little bit. One of my rural communities painted all of their fire hydrants. Well, to them, they were just working with what they had. But what we were able to do is just through a conversation, through a visit, be able to say, hey, you guys are actually, you know, using existing infrastructure to execute a public, you know, art project for wayfinding and signage. And they were like, what? You know, and I'm like, if you're ever going to go after grant money, you have to be able to talk about the things that are already going on, on in your community. Just a small example there. On the right hand side of the screen, you see those three main areas where a cultural district lives and moves. Okay. These are the things that can come out of it. These are the ways that you can engage that certification and leverage it inside of your community. The left hand side, those are just really the guiding lights of the program. You know, things that we want to see come about, things that we hope that people pursue once they retain that certification. Now, these are the things that, that are most likely achieved. They're not concurrent. They're not, you know, in a certain order. You may get one of them and not the other. You may lose one. We hope you don't. Um, but I don't want to, you know, make you think that this is what has to be present all the time. You can sort of cobble this together in whatever order makes sense for you, and you might reach one before you reach another. Um, so we don't, you know, we got to hold on loosely to some of these goals so that they actually can can suit the flexibility of the program. And this is what it's all about. Um, you know, technical assistance is like the lamest term ever, but it is the coolest job on earth. Um, it's what I'm doing right now. We used to do it a lot in person. Um, we miss that a lot. We used to bounce around those 41 parishes all the time. Um, but mainly, you know, we're looking at cultural activity. Did it used to be a hub of activity? Can it be again? What does it take to get it there? Um, not so much looking at the phrase, we want it to be what it used to be because Oftentimes that's not great, but mainly looking at what can it be now? Like, what do we have here now that we can leverage and that we can build on? In case you're not familiar with our office, I wanted to show you guys where we live. Um, we are inside of a much larger network of agencies. And the benefit of that is that we are not the only agency that you're connected to once you become a cultural district. A lot of people, again, just don't have the language to know that they might be working on a folk life project. We have a state folklorist. I immediately put you in contact with her. She enriches that project, right? She may have already done research on it. She may have other people for you to know. A lot of times we don't know what those, you know, there's not like a one-to-one -one benefit that can come from becoming a cultural district, but we do know that there are other partners out there in our family of agencies that we can connect you to. Most recently, the Achafla National Heritage Area was moved underneath our office. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, these are some random phrases to show you some of the things that come up whenever we are looking at a cultural district's plan and focus. Um, you know, lately, especially after the year that we have just been through, you know, imagining what the future could look like in terms of arts and culture, you know, correctly interpreting the past, figuring out what that history is, uncovering those layers that may not have been talked about. Um, and then also collective consciousness, you know, it's really fun whenever I'm in opposite corners of the boot and there are people that are either having the same problems or having the same successes. And it's truly one of the joys of being a part of that cultural districts network is that I can connect those people to either help them solve that problem more quickly or to share how they you know, were able to overcome it. And then sense of place. Again, if you don't remember anything else from all of this rambling about the program, sense of place underscores everything that the cultural districts program and the division of the arts is seeking to achieve. You know, we just turned in our, um, every three years strategic plan to the National Endowment for the Arts and sense of place was in everything that we do. Everything from our percent for art program where they're trying to have those sculptures and paintings and all the things that are installed in those buildings directly reflect the area to the cultural districts where we, we never want it to get so divorced from where it, it came from that we don't recognize it anymore, right? In terms of that community identity. So in practicality, here's the fun part. It can look like any of these things. And the best thing is you're not doing it in a vacuum. If somebody's already doing this work, you know, the cultural district can hitch its wagon to that and keep going. Or it can be an umbrella and a neutral Switzerland where all of that work can come together and you can eliminate any of that, you know, sort of struggle uh, for the credit or for the power. 
Um, sometimes it's as simple as people getting together in, in the same room, usually a Zoom room these days. And sometimes it's as big as, you know, a massive public art project that takes over, you know, three walls in the community. It can really vary. You know, the beauty in having 115 districts is that they do it in 115 different ways. Um, so here's a couple of examples. These are from, there's three examples from three different parts of the state. The first is uh, right here in Baton Rouge where I'm based out of, the Mid-City Cultural District is huge. And so in light of the size of that district, they were really struggling with how do they even talk about their identity when it encompasses so many neighborhoods. You know, in the city of New Orleans, the Uptown University Cultural District is that big. So, you know, they kind of have the same problem. How do they even approach an area that's that massive where there's disparate identities that comprise that district? So what they did was they had a local artist uh, paint a really simple tree on some plywood and they moved it around to all of their events in 2019 that were held throughout the district, whether they were arts and cultural events, you know, performances at, you know, an outdoor park, whatever it may be where they could put this board. And they would allow the community to add leaves, things that they thought about their neighborhood, things they think about their city. You know, it could be a drawing, it could be a word, it could be a phrase. And what they... Uh, came to eventually, they hired a local designer and this is the logo that was created um, for their cultural district out of you know, all the consensus of that feedback uh, from the community members, so pretty cool. Secondly, um, this is the fire hydrant project um, out of tiny little Bernice in Union Parish. They're almost at the Arkansas line and they, have, they don't have a lot of historic buildings. You know, They're one of the victims of a lot of the teardowns that happened in the 90s and they don't really have even a lot of historic civic buildings left. They have a couple of, you know, things in their historic built environment, but not many. And they wanted to do a public art project, but they didn't have the funding for, you know, a mural or, you know, anything that was much larger. So they used what they had and y'all, they did not even tell the fire department that they were painting these. Um, I went up there on a visit and they were driving me around to show me all of the fire hydrants that had been painted. And I said, well, how, what, how easy was it to work with the local fire department? And they looked at me and they said, oh, we, didn't, we haven't told them yet. We're assuming they'll find out. <laughs> um, so it was like guerrilla public art in this tiny little rural area. And it's mostly retired school teachers that are on that committee. So they are just living their best lives up there in Bernice. Uh, but the cool thing about this is that now they have plotted them for people to find. And it's become you know, a cool activity to do, especially in COVID. A lot of these are in people's front yards. They got all this feedback and buy-in from the people that live there. Uh, they were so proud of them. They were like sitting in their, you know, front yard whenever we drove by waving and they were so excited to show me this. None of the people that painted these were artists, y'all. They were all just people that lived there. They got so lucky. They just like turned these people loose with the approved materials and said, do your best or your worst. Um, so it's really cool. They've painted like 180 fire hydrants around that tiny little community. Um, uh oh, there he goes. We're on high alert today. Um, lastly, in Ruston, they um, are a predominantly white community. There's um, not a lot of evident diversity in that community. So one of the things they wanted to do was to highlight some of the ethnic foods that are in existence there that people may not be aware of. So the cultural district brought together the tourism bureau, the mayor's office, um, the Main Street community folks, and they all got together and they said, what can we do? And so what came out of that was Rustin Cultural Eats. And so what they did was they had these people that they'd done the research on almost from a folk life perspective. Just a second. Let me try to get his attention. Not a Zoom call without a disruption. All right. We'll let Kelsey get her dog back in the crate or kennel here and give her just a moment. Um, again, thank you everyone for joining. Probably a few people joined since I gave the intro, so appreciate everyone's time. Kelsey? Okay, let's try it again. I got my child under control, um, somewhat under control. Thank y'all for being patient. So anyway, a really cool project for them also could be something that could be adapted to be COVID friendly. And I think that's the most important thing is that as we're looking at and how we're gonna move forward, figuring out how can we make these events appropriate? How can we make them safe? Um, and while we're still executing according to the principles of the program. 
Um, next up, oh, we're almost done. This is another great activity that you can do that's totally free. Um, we had somebody track their activity in Arnoville. It's also a rural area in Acadiana. And they were just going about their business on a weekend with a couple friends and they tracked all the spending that happened in that community. And it's a wonderful way that's a really easy tool to prove the economic value of why you need a mix of businesses, right? You know, one of the, the highlights of the Coastal Districts program is trying to figure out what is, what is the impact that arts and culture has on these businesses that aren't necessarily cultural in nature, like the hardware store, right? So it's something really easy that you can do that's almost just like a little narrative of some community champions as they're moving throughout the community. So lastly, I'll always end with this. Um, the first thing is, the most important thing is to be honest about where you are in this process. Um, there is a really funny Nebraska tourism campaign where they just owned up to it. The slogan says, Nebraska, it's not for everyone, right? And it makes you laugh and it makes you curious about what is going on there that wouldn't be for everyone. And so the, the, the intent of the cultural districts program is really to hone in on that identity and get honest about where you are in that process and what needs to come next. And then just get on the train. If there's already work happening in the community, it may not be exactly what we want in the long term, but in the short term, let's roll with it. Let's, let's be a part of it. Let's help it, right? Let's amplify that. And I find that's really hard whenever we almost have analysis paralysis where we don't want to step forward because it's like you don't want to really, you know, do things the wrong way. But the most important thing is just to get started. And then look outside your lane. The unique partnerships that have underscored some of the, the projects I just mentioned, those are just three projects from the last year. Um, there's so many more examples that we could have. There's so many more examples even, you know, from the city of New Orleans that we could list here. But most of those are successful because they, they looked outside the norm in terms of who to partner with. Another thing we encourage is to get off the hater struggle bus. You know, I was standing in line in, in the airport in Dallas to fly back last year and I overheard somebody telling a, a military um, officer who was being reassigned to Baton Rouge, who was coming from Hawaii of all places. He said about Louisiana, he was like, well, it's not a terrible place to live. And I just thought to myself, man, people don't realize the power of being a brand ambassador for where they live. Um, you should never say anything negative about where you're currently living. And then some cliches are true, right? It's a marathon, not a sprint. The good part about this is that we know the work, we know what needs to be done. We know that we just need to take that next step. And so that's the most important part of all this is that it's gonna take time. A lot of people wanna become a cultural district so that they can you know, transform their business community overnight and you know, save all of their artists and have this thriving you know, cultural community. And it's like, okay, but we have to start somewhere. So maybe like we said earlier, that first step is just having that conversation. Um, and I think that's it for me. Nathan? All right, that was great, Kelsey. Thank you so much. I appreciate all those insights and that statewide perspective. So our next uh, presenter is Pam or Pamela Broom with Nucor Inc. Nucor is a community development corporation that builds affordable housing and provides loans and grants to entrepreneurs and promotes uh, diversity in particular and small business in our community. And they also have a program that Pam manages called the Seventh Ward Revitalization Project that is part of their deep and longstanding commitment to the Seventh Ward of New Orleans, which um, is the place that Pamela is gonna show us around the new AP Tarot Seventh Ward Cultural District. And uh, you know, PRC began having conversations with Nucor about uh, opportunities really in that community uh, a couple of years ago, uh, looking at a few vacant or underutilized buildings that had real uh, heritage significance. And Pam has just been a complete and ready partner the whole time. And we're really looking forward to continuing to deepen our partnership and do more work with the community there in the seventh ward, because it's an area of a long legacy and uh, I think tremendous potential. So with that, Pam, I'm gonna share your response. <clears throat> And you can show us around. I'll start with a map, if that makes sense to you. Yeah. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Um, 
this is a great opportunity to share some of um, the most exciting work that I'm having an opportunity to be engaged in right now. The map that you see is um, a map that was created to designate what is now uh, the AP Turo Cultural District in the Seventh Ward. So the portion of the Seventh Ward neighborhood that we're working in, that footprint is adjacent uh, to Treme and it butts up against uh, other parts of the neighborhood. When we looked at applying for cultural district designation, we saw that that um, area was blank and it wasn't connected. And we were thinking, man, we have to really fill in that space and bring into the cultural districts program the richness um, of the heritage and legacy of the neighborhood. So what you're looking at are some actual points of interest that exist. Currently, we're working on a project to map and document the cultural district area that is pretty much the area from North Claiborne to Gentilly Boulevard, St. Bernard Avenue to Elysian Fields. Um, it is in addition to what was originally the Seventh Ward Revitalization Project's footprint that Newcorp identified. And what's exciting about it is that we have so many anchor institutions that uh, are connected to intergenerational wealth, educational uh, as well as community-based from Nor Navra uh, Historic Library in the neighborhood to St. Augustine Senior High School. Now the Good Shepherd uh, School has located in the area. Uh, as well as we have the historic Valina C. Jones school building that has been uh, sitting vacant since 2008. And we're really interested in getting um, a lot of support around uh, adaptive reuse or revitalizing that building. So you'll see other points of interest, but what we're interested in doing as well um, is to not only identify the existing buildings, but places in the neighborhood that had historic uh, and legacy significance that we could create something like an overlay map to really demonstrate uh, the richness of the area. You're looking at the Autocrat Club building. And if you know anything about the history of the Autocrat Club and to know that they have been around for a hundred plus years and they're still there and progressing uh, as uh, a neighborhood cultural anchor. Um, that's an amazing asset. That's St. Augustine High School. It's on AP Turo Avenue. And as I said, it's one of the cultural um, historical and educational anchors. Uh, I understand it's one of, if not the oldest Catholic uh, African-American uh, male high schools in the country. And of course, iconic and amazing. We have our black masking Mardi Gras Indians as part of our our cultural heritage and legacy as well. And we're looking forward to connecting with culture bearers throughout the neighborhood and also working in partnership with other designated cultural districts, especially uh, Treme, and also reaching out to the other neighborhood associations within the neighborhood so that we can determine some really exciting ways to support and uplift uh, groups like the Black Masking Mardi Gras Indians and other culture bearers. This is St. Leo the Great um, Catholic Church. Throughout the neighborhood, there are um, uh, long-standing institutions um, 
of worship. We have not only St. Leo the Great, but we also have Corpus Christi and Epiphany. Those parishes have combined and we're looking forward to working with groups like the Delta Foundation, Delta Sigma Theta, uh, and they have now purchased what was the old Epiphany campus to do uh, community building, um, arts and culture, educational programming on that site as well. Right there is the statue of A.P. Turo, attorney A.P. Turo, um, contemporary of Thurgood Marshall, who did amazing uh, advocacy and work around education and civil rights in the neighborhood at the intersection of St. Bernard Avenue and A.P. Turo Avenue is the A.P. Turo Statue and Civil Rights Memorial Park. One of the things um, that New Corp is working with other Seventh Ward stakeholders, uh, Mayor Cantrell's office, to have the statue refurbished and the park upgraded to reflect stormwater management uh, for the neighborhood and to demonstrate what's possible, even uh, though it's a small pocket park, it's very central. And we like to say that it's the gateway to the AP Turo Cultural District in the Seventh Ward. This is the AP Turo um, family home and it was recently added to the National Register for Historic Properties. And it's right there on Prier Street in the neighborhood. And this is just a look at the thoroughfare along, who's that? The same sorry. Name. It's in the neutral oh, ground. St. Anthony walking trail. Okay, yes. So that's just one of those um, visual opportunities. This is just the outside. Dillard University. Yep. What's that, Nathan? I would say this is just this at the is northern periphery of the district. Right, Dillard. right. So this is Dillard University. Is that Dillard as well? Uh, this is Nora Navra. This I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, Nora. this is the library. This this is awesome. That is the library. It's really beautiful. Um, recently, the last what year and a half, two years ago, Nora Navra was refurbished. Uh, well, rebuilt after Hurricane Katrina, and the work is absolutely fabulous, and it is an attractor to all generations in the neighborhood. So prior to COVID, you would come to the library and you would see all of the computer stations filled, the community room um, filled with neighborhood members attending neighborhood focused meetings and trainings. And uh, it's definitely an asset uh, to the neighborhood. This is, I would say, <laughs> my pet project as part of uh, New Corp. This is the Pharmacy of Wellness Hub. And we are developing the Pharmacy of Wellness Hub as um, an intersection between urban agriculture and um, medicine for community wellness. So we're focused on, focusing on plant medicine, um, and what we're doing is developing this on two vacant properties that are owned by uh, New Orleans Redevelopment Authority. We entered into a lease agreement for three years with Nora to develop this site and Tulane Small Center for Collaborative Design awarded us a pro bono design build award. So the structure that you see on site is an open air structure that um, the front grid 
that you see is actually a map of that portion of the neighborhood. So January of 2021, we will begin putting in the growing infrastructure. And one of the um, portions of that growing structure will include a section that mimics the backyards of homes in the seventh ward because we're hoping to be able to inspire neighbors to grow in their yard. So we wanna have um, a portion of the site that is really a training and interactive opportunity for people in the neighborhood. So stay tuned. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Nathan, I don't. This is, this is the Epiphany. Yeah. Oh, this is the Epiphany campus. I was thinking that really looks good. That's Epiphany. So the Delta Sigma Theta uh, sorority through their foundation, they've purchased that campus and they are in stages of development for community benefit. Yes. Yeah, that's a great example of a project that might benefit from historic tax credits that are made available. Absolutely. Absolutely. This is the um, historic Valina C. Jones uh, site. As I said, it's been standing vacant since 2008. It has a storied history and legacy. Not only did uh, children in the seventh ward uh, had the opportunity to be educated, their elementary age children. At one time, it also housed the normal training for young African-American male and female uh, high school students that were entering into the uh, teaching profession. And actually my mother was one of those young people that uh, studied there and got her normal training. And whenever she, would say Valina C. Jones School and the normal training, um, her eyes would just shine. And she was very proud of the um, education and the opportunity. So New Corp is working, as I said, with other Seventh Ward stakeholders um, to look at ways to acquire site control, uh, working alongside Orleans Parish School Board to redevelop the site for community benefit in the 21st century. That's fantastic. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Some of these are also from the application, just areas of, you know, sort of latent potential within the districts. Absolutely. This looks like the house on O'Reilly Street that butts up against the property uh, where the pharmacy is being developed. And I have often passed by with Vaughn Fourier, my executive director at New Corp, and we dream about being able to acquire that house and um, refurbish it as part of the pharmacia complex. So I'm just putting it out there. <laughs> into the wider universe. There's Hunters Field. Hunters Field, yes, and that's the, um, that's the new uh, brain fog. What do you call that? The, the Nord? Um, uh, the rec center? Thing? The rec center, right, exactly. So Hunters Field also has a story history in the community. Yeah. And these are just it's another um, example of properties uh, throughout the neighborhood that have potential for redevelopment. And isn't that beautiful? That's, that's the park. That's the AP Turo um, statue and Civil Rights Memorial Park. And we're looking forward to working closely with New Orleans Redevelopment Authority to support the revitalization of the St. Bernard Avenue corridor. And uh, 
as I said earlier, that statue and park are sort of a gateway to that to that portion of the neighborhood. So thank you. Thank you, Pam. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's a great story about your mom having attended. Oh yeah. Well, that's really, uh, really she, <laughs> Yeah. She was very proud of that. Thank you so much uh, for taking us on that. Absolutely, thank you. Um, and next up is Michael Mancuso, who's gonna take us on a tour of the other new cultural district uh, in Orleans Parish, which is Turo Boloney. He is on the board of the Turo Boloney Neighborhood Association. And um, in addition to that, is also on the board of Louisiana Landmark Society and is an attorney at Elkins where he has facilitated and enabled a lot of adaptive reuse projects. So he knows uh, from his professional life how powerful historic tax credits can be in bringing buildings back into use. And so when you know we pointed out that his neighborhood was by the accident of history essentially left off the map, you know he understood uh, how significant that was and I'm sure we'll tell us about one particular site um, he and I have discussed is actually how we met um, that is a perfect candidate for historic tax credits uh, that will now be eligible because of the creation of the district. But um, Michael, I'm going to let you give us a tour. Do you want me to scroll through your slides or scroll through the slides or do you want to do that? Oh, yes. If you don't mind, you can. Okay. I'll, I'll let you take charge with that uh, in case I, I don't scroll correctly. Um, but thank you for the introduction. I really appreciate it. And uh, I appreciate your all your hard work in putting this together and, and working with Kelsey, in, uh, who's, who, you know, met with us to explain uh, some of the benefits. And I said, you know, I am familiar with some of the, at least for the, the, the tax related benefits with this, but there are lots of other, like you said, uh, placemaking um, and uh, other ancillary benefits to being a, a cultural district. And you know we're really excited in the neighborhood uh, to be part of the program and to you know to brainstorming and trying to think of some uh, of you know ways we could take advantage to the program. Uh, and I think right now you have a slide with uh, you know the 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 Toro Bouigny neighborhood. Uh, it's uh, a, a quite a large area. It's generally bounded by St. Charles Avenue, Napoleon Avenue, Louisiana Avenue, and Magazine Street. Uh, uh, you know, the, the neighborhood, it sort of consists of, you know, historically two separate areas, one Faubourg Bouligny, uh, which was uh, uh, developed, uh, uh, you know, as, as a part with along with the property, you know, with Napoleon Avenue sort of as its centerpiece, and which relates to a lot of the, the streets, the street names that are related to Napoleon and his battles like Austerlitz and Milan uh, uh, and other streets. And then on the other side, closer to Louisiana, uh, those parcels were developed separately. Uh, uh, whereas there had, uh, I think it was her name, Madame Delachaise uh, and Madame Evart, who owned, uh, who owned, or the property owners who sold and subdivided those lots. And a lot of the, the streets there that were created from that were named after them and their relatives. Uh, uh, and so it's a little bit of an interesting history. So they, those two separate areas have come together to form the, the tour of Bouligny that we, uh, we know today. Uh, and I said, and just in general, I said, really the neighborhood is sort of a, a microcosm of New Orleans in the sense that it contains, you know, pretty much a, a, a wide range of uses and, and uh, that, you could, that you could find everything from, you know, sort of large institutional uses with, uh, with a Turo infirmary and there's lots of commercial space uh, associated with that. Uh, oh, well, I'll go through the slides. Uh, uh, and then you have historic elements like the uh, St. Charles Avenue streetcar, uh, uh, which bounds uh, the, uh, uh, the on St. Charles Avenue. And you can see right uh, behind that, uh, well, I was thinking that may be part of the, uh, one of the, the LSU Medical School office buildings, uh, which is adjacent to, to uh, Turo Infirmary and as part of the sort of commercial and institutional type uses that you find there. 
Uh, one thing, there's, uh, there are also uh, several historic places of worship. Uh, you have a tour of synagogue on, on St. Charles Avenue uh, near Napoleon. Also there's uh, on Napoleon Avenue, St. Stephen's Church. Um, and we'll see another interesting example of that in a little, in a little bit. Uh, I said, uh, uh, we don't have uh, lots of green space in the neighborhood. Uh, it's pretty fairly built up, but there's a, there's a small pocket park right here uh, on St. Charles. Uh, there's another small park on Napoleon and, uh, and uh, Magazine. But uh, so those green spaces are, are greatly appreciated. Uh, this is another church, the uh, Unity Temple on St. Charles Avenue, which I think is just an, another example of so sort of a, sort of the diversity and the architectural diversity of the neighborhood. So it's quite a it's a it's a, a, a landmark is it's so noticeable on St. Charles and, and very different than the sort of the 19th century architecture that that predominates. Um, but it's a, a it's, it's a really a, a, a really standout building um, that uh, everybody recognizes. Uh, also uh, near that, there's the Rain Methodist Church. There's another sort of uh, large church uh, that's in the area. I know they, they the the steeple was heavily damaged in Hurricane Katrina and was renovated, um, but uh, it's it it occupies a large stretch of St. Charles Avenue. Uh, and I think uh, I was mentioning, uh, you know, in addition to the uh, places of worship, uh, you know, there are lots of there's commercial aspects to the the to the district. Uh, one, you know, uh, this is the Britannia Bar. There are near uh, Turo Infirmary. There are quite a few uh, restaurants and um, and some uh, some shops. Uh, some things that are that are adjacent to the uh, near St. Charles Avenue in near Turo Infirmary. Um, and then along Britannia Street right there, there are quite a few restaurants. Uh, here you see uh, Turo Infirmary, um, which you write note in the slide, it was its new location. It was much further downtown. And then in, the eight, in 1882, uh, they uh, bought their current location and have you know, expanded uh, over the years. And I think in the next slide, you see there's a note that there's some uh, public art uh, on Britannia Street. That's one of the uh, Turo uh, medical office buildings um, that's across the street from the main campus of the of the hospital, uh, which has some uh, some public art there in the entrance lobby or the outdoor lobby. Uh, and the next slide, yeah, you see there's a uh, on Penniston Street. Uh, there was a uh, it's sort of an example. There's a, 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 a wide variety of housing stock um, in the neighborhood, which you'll see. You know, you have everything from you know grand mansions on St. Charles Avenue to uh, you know uh, smaller you know shotgun uh, singles and doubles, and also lots of uh, smaller uh, multifamily housing, such as such as this. Uh, this is an example of another house on uh, Coliseum Street. Uh, which is an example of, you know, the just sort of the wide variety of housing stock and some of the houses are, uh, uh, you know, are lucky enough to be situated on nice <laughs> big uh, lots, uh, which is which are hard to come by, uh, you know, in New Orleans, but uh, let's see if you go to the next one, there's, uh, yeah, there's the, the Grant Black House, that's an, a, 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 a listed on the National Register. Uh, you know, one of the examples of the of the uh, of the, the bigger houses in the neighborhood. And uh, oh, let's see what she said. This is uh, uh, an example. The next slide. This is adjacent to Turo. Uh, I believe it's adjacent to, to Turo Infirmary on the commercial strip on Britannia Street. Uh, you know, a lot of the houses, if you, you'll see this, they're, you know, uh, sort of adjacent to Turo, there have been houses or, you know, originally there were residential structures that have been converted to, uh, you know, office or commercial uses. Uh, and this one uh, was uh, a quite, you know, a, a beautiful home at one point, which was converted, it which, which was a restaurant for several years, which closed and has been 
unused since then. Um, and, uh, you know, you know, it's become quite a, you know, it would be quite a development opportunity uh, because it's been abandoned for several years and is in not the best shape. Uh, so we're hoping that somebody will take some interest in that and, and uh, restore that. And I think uh, this is an example of some of the under, you said underutilized spaces. These are some, uh, some uh, office and commercial buildings that are adjacent to the Toro Infirmary campus. Uh, I noticed that they, uh, you know, are, they apparently are not used or at one point were used in connection with a hospital, but are not now and would be available for redevelopment. Yeah, and this is uh, the slide. This uh, Queen Anne style house. This was at one point, a, you know, I think it was a, a larger residence that is now um, uh, now multifamily uh, apartments uh, on St. Charles Avenue, um, which is another example of sort of the diversity in housing. It, it, the, really, the neighborhood runs the gamut from small to large and everything in between. And I think the next slide, this is one of the um, sort of anchors of the neighborhood. Uh, this is the McDonough number no. seven school, which is uh, on Milan Street and uh, uh, now currently houses Ottoman Charter School. Um, the, you know, right now, there's just a question mark about what uh, ultimately will be the fate of the, the, the school. It's currently occupied, but um, uh, it's uh, slated for closure by the uh, Orleans Parish School Board, and um, and its future is really uncertain. But um, but whatever the ultimate use is, the neighborhood is, uh, you know, is, is enthusiastically supportive of trying of, of an adaptive reuse of that building and a preservation of the of the historic structure, as it's one of the one of the very first. Um, uh, public schools that were built with the McDonough funds um, in uh, 1877 it was designed by William Ferret, uh, and it would be our hope that that building ultimately would be listed on the National Register. There's another Ferret designed school a few blocks away, uh, which is uh, almost identical in, in, in design. Uh, which was constructed about the same time, which is listed on the, is part of St. George's School and is listed on the National Register. So we would hope that that would be listed on the National Register and ultimately preserved um, in connection with its, uh, the next phase in its use. Right. And I think, I think that's it. Thanks, Nathan. Correct. Thank you so much, Michael. Mm -hmm. I love what you have in each of these districts for all of their uniqueness, this commonality of these two great educational institutions with long histories in the neighborhood and a desire for the community members to see those repurposed in a way that, that really benefits the community. And it'd be great if they can both have some artist lofts somewhere in the upper story, some studio space, mm -hmm. for creative folks or, or crafts people, because um, that would be a perfect way to reuse those buildings and keep them uh, in commerce in the community. All right, our our next and final presenter is Katie or Catherine O'Dell, who has uh, been working in Louisiana Cultural Districts since 2017 um, as a gallery director for Louisiana Crafts Guild. And since 2018, she has been partnering uh, in that role with the Arts Council, uh, managing Arts Market New Orleans. And so some of you have probably been to the Palmer Park Arts Market, which is also in a Louisiana Cultural District in Carroll Valley Grove, which PRC has a long history in. Um, but it has just recently moved to City Park, and Katie's going to tell us all about the ways in which um, they are adapting to these very challenging times of the COVID pandemic and preserving opportunities for uh, artists, craftspeople, um, keep working in our cultural districts, and to um, enable you to shop local this holiday season and do it safely. So Katie, thank you so much for joining us. Yes, yeah, thank you, uh, Nathan, for having me, uh, Evan, uh, last minute here. Um, so yes, I I'm the Associate Director of the Louisiana Crafts Guild and I work with um, Arts Council New Orleans 
Um, I have a gallery in Canal Place, which is in a cultural district. And uh, I feel like our competitive edge among uh, the mall shoppers out here is that we do get to off, um, waive the local sales tax on most of our items for being handmade um, original works of art. Um, I am going to share my desktop. Uh, my screen here and get us uh, into my slide share. Um, so with the cultural districts, they do have a definition of what um, applies as the handmade art. And so with, with my, um, with the business that I uh, do, can everyone see my screen? Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, okay. Um, sorry. If so, to... Damn it. Looks good. I can do, I have the present thing on now. Um, so for us, we, we love it, uh, because, you know, it gives our customers an incentive to purchase handmade because, uh, down here it's, you know, a 10% sales tax combined, um, with, uh, with it, you know, things aren't always um, applicable, like handmade soap is a mass produced thing. So, um, you know, things that are clay, sculpture, uh, fiber, glass, uh, all one of a kind things we sell. Um, but with the, with the arts market, arts market New Orleans. Uh, so yes, it takes place in a cultural district. The cultural district um, became a cultural district in 2017. And we've been hosting the market um, out in the Palmer Park neighborhood since about 2007, 2008. Um, so it took a while before we could, uh, before our artists in at that event could take advantage of um, the tax exemption on the handmade works that they sell. Um, we are, uh, due to these times the, with the pandemic, we, uh, we have struggled as an art community because we can't bring our artists out to events anymore. We can't host those events. Um, you know, right, there was the big hole with the quarantine for it. Um, and just in the past month, we have been able to get back out to markets and safely bring our artists back out in City Park. Um, it has been a struggle uh, working with the city, getting permission to go to different areas since uh, we're used to being in a uh, park managed by the city of New Orleans. Um, now we're working with uh, City Park, which is uh, managed independently outside of the city. So um, we're able to host our event out there and we do have upcoming events, in-person events uh, this Saturday and this Sunday in City Park, um, next Saturday and the following Saturday, all in City Park. And then we've also partnered with the city of Kenner, another cultural district where we'll be, um, where we'll have an Artist Sunday event. Um, and all of our events right now are going to be socially distanced, follow those protocols. Um, we, you know, we require our, our participants all to be masked, all attendees, we do do contact tracing. And we've even gone as far as um, socially distancing our tents. Uh, so there's lots of room to shop around um, out there. Um, and the majority of our vendors do utilize the tax exemption opportunities of the cultural districts. And City Park is in a cultural district, as um, I guess Kelsey mentioned earlier, uh, down the pipeline, uh, the entire city of New Orleans uh, will become a cultural district. And um, most of the events that I do work on with the Arts Council and Louisiana Crafts Guild, the festivals and events that we do produce are already in cultural dis uh, districts. I haven't encountered one yet where I've had to tell participants that they can't waive the local sales tax. Um, even when I'm out and doing events in Lafayette. Um, so 
when the pandemic happened, um, you know, back in March, we transformed to hosting virtual arts markets through the craft, um, through Arts Market New Orleans, um, Instagram, Facebook, social media. And we just blew up social media feeds on the Saturdays that we would usually take over Palmer Park and um, brought the artist's work out there via the hashtag virtual arts market. And that was really fun because we actually invented the hashtag and it kind of took off a little worldwide. There's still less than 5,000 uh, tags of art under it. Majority local New Orleans, Louisiana artists, but some international artists have have taken ownership of our virtual arts market tag, which uh, was pretty cool to watch to see that our market did that and got some people worldwide chiming in. Um, it was, you know, as far as events at the beginning of quarantine, when everyone was at home and excited about Zoom, uh, we had a lot of fun. And it was great for our artists to be educated, like educate themselves and do um, presentations of themselves that maybe they would have never explored before. Um, here are some screenshots of what artists, you know, contributed to the hashtag or went live on those market dates. Uh, we've got, you know, a glass blower or someone taking uh, pottery out of their kiln. Um, we had a jewelry maker show off their work. Um, and then it was, uh, and it was great to see more of our artists of all ages, all different backgrounds, getting engaged, going through, posting on their social media and spreading more love um, on the social media than we had before the pandemic. Um, and it was even great because we, we even got to see the proof of sales um, for our, um, for the market while it took place virtually which was really fun. Um, one thing that's great, interesting about the cultural districts too, in regards to local artists is that the city sales tax exemption will even, uh, the local sales tax exemption will even be applied to work sold online. So if the artist uh, is an online vendor, um, but they're based out of a cultural district, they can waive that local tax still on an item purchased from online. Um, and so our online virtual arts market too, we had, uh, it was also fun seeing just different institutions, different brands, whatnot, um, give us shout out on social media, but still it wasn't as, it was rewarding, but still not the same as meeting in person. Um, <clears throat> So we did a couple of these series over the pandemic um, and it was just fun collecting all the memories and seeing how much love because uh, we don't always get it written down at the end of the day at, at our events and to see you know people coming back and saying that uh, they, they still get the experience. We had Margaret Orr um, comment up here uh, that it was great that we had the opportunity we got workout, um, and then um, upcoming. Uh, we're we're now you know breaking through this point in the city where uh, we can start you know gathering safely with larger groups. Um, so we do do the art market socially distance. Um, Lunafet will be going on this year and it will be two weekends. Um, next weekend, the uh, 12th and 13th, uh, the 11th through the 13th, and then the 18th through the 20th. And um, so instead of bringing everyone, you know, to watch a film, um, you know, a quick little film uh, out in Lafayette Square, uh, there'll be, you know, something you can just do at your leisure during the evening. It's going to be more art installations that uh, won't be timed. You just go out, out, out there and explore. And you can already, there's already been some of it popping up on the Lafayette Greenway. Um, 
and uh, throughout the city that you may have noticed already. And if you go to LunaFET, uh, our website for LunaFET 2020, you'll find more details there. And um, yeah, if you're looking for more information on the arts markets, uh, you're welcome to find us on Facebook, Arts Market New Orleans, where we have all of our dates um, for the upcoming markets. And in 2020, we hope to be going back to our old, I mean, in 2021, we hope to be going back to our old cultural district uh, out where Palmer Park is. Wonderful. All right, thank you so much, Katie. I'm glad to know you'll be going back to Carrollton. Uh, it may not be Palmer Park you go back to. We'll see what the name, name of the park is. Yes, yes. <laughs> Great neighborhood. Um, and PRC was happy to partner before I was on staff with the neighborhood there to create that cultural district. And oh, wow, thank you. <laughs> so, yeah, great neighborhood. Mm -hmm. All right. Oh, stop share. Okay, well, so I, I'm looking in the, the Q&A. We've got one question for you, Pam, which is from Julie, who lives just at the edge of the district and was wondering if you could show share your email address so perhaps the two of you can, can connect. So, oh, if you want absolutely. To Yes, yeah, Pamela, because or... um, I'm doing it from my phone. So it's Pamela at New Corp Inc, N-E-W-C-O-R-P-I-N-C dot com. And I'm broom like a sweeping broom, Pamela Broom. <laughs> and I'd love to connect. Great. Well, thank you, Pam and Michael and Kelsey and Katie. Um, uh, these, these were all great presentations and I, I hope that all of our uh, participants see the, the synergy that is here um, between place and you know the built environment, but that broader sense of, of place and then the creative spirit that then comes out in arts and crafts and, and culture bearers. You know, I, I think of our neighborhoods as kind of like the campuses on which our culture bearers create. You can't really imagine uh, Mardi Gras Indians or a second line in Phoenix. It just doesn't seem right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in the background. Well, thank you, Nathan, for doing this and, and, and inviting us. Appreciate it so much. Well, I'm ha happy, happy to do it. Um, and I, we've gone a little longer than I, I thought we might, so we don't have to to stay on too much longer because I want to be very respectful of your time, but certainly um, any closing thoughts or uh, questions for one another? Looking forward to connecting with everybody. <laughs> yeah, same here. Great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, New Orleans, as Kelsey showed, really is lucky to have so many cultural districts. And I, I think that um, we can do more to to collaborate amongst ourselves uh, as cultural districts and as people who care about these issues. So we'll look forward to doing more uh, to facilitate that in 2021. Maybe we can actually be face to face in the same room at some point. <laughs> Wouldn't that be something? <laughs> yeah, one, one can dream, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, let me, um, okay. As I said, be respectful of, of y'all's time. I won't go on long, but I uh, want to thank Daniil, who is our behind the scenes uh, mm -hmm. virtual programming assistant at PRC and kind of the tech whiz that, that made tonight Yay, happen. Yay, Daniil. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Colleagues at PRC. Yeah, um, and again, hope to see many of you at our uh, holiday home tour on December 12th and 13th. All right. Thank you all so much. Thanks, Nathan. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye. Yeah.